Trendelenburg Sign and Gate. These were named after a German surgeon called Friedrich Trendelenburg. The Trendelenburg Sign and Gate are found in individuals with a weak or compromised hip abductor mechanism. This can occur on one or both sides and it can be compensated or uncompensated. The abductor mechanism of the hip consists of the anatomical structures that work together to maintain the stability and mobility of the pelvis in the frontal plane in the form of a lever system. Levers. A lever is a simple machine that enables an applied force to overcome a given resistance. It has a fulcrum, effort, and weight. There are three types of levers, first, second, and third class levers. The abductor mechanism of the hip is a first-class lever, meaning it has its fulcrum situated between the effort and the weight. Mechanical advantage in a first-class lever. There are two distances considered in relation to the fulcrum. The distance from the fulcrum to the effort is called the effort arm. The distance from the fulcrum to the weight is called the weight arm. And then there are three possible scenarios. Number one. The fulcrum may be situated centrally between the effort and the weight. When the weight arm and effort arm are equal in length, there is no mechanical advantage gained because the effort required to lift the weight is of the same magnitude as the weight itself. The fulcrum may be situated closer to the weight, making the weight arm shorter than the effort arm. When the weight arm is shorter than the effort arm, less effort will be required to lift the weight and this is called mechanical advantage. The third, if the fulcrum is closer to the effort, the effort arm is shorter than the weight arm. In this case, a mechanical disadvantage occurs because the fulcrum is closer to the effort and more effort is required to lift the weight. The structures of the abductor mechanism include the hip joint, the abductor muscles, neck or femur, and body weight. The hip joint acts as a fulcrum, the effort is by the abductor muscles, and the load is the body weight. Let's briefly take a look at the anatomy. The hip joint is the articulation between the head of femur and the acetabulum of the hip bone. It's a ball and socket synovial type of joint. And then there are two main abductor muscles, the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. The gluteus medius originates from the ilium of the hip bone between the anterior and posterior gluteal lines and inserts on the lateral aspect of the greater trochanter. The gluteus minimus originates from the ilium just beneath the gluteus medius and inserts on the anterior aspect of the greater trochanter. They are both supplied by the superior gluteal nerve and their action is hip abduction and internal rotation. Their function is to maintain balance of the pelvis during walking, running or single leg standing by balancing the pelvis once the opposite limb is off the ground. The picture shown represents a first-class lever system across the hip. The hip joint is in the center as the fulcrum. There are two opposing forces, the body weight exerting a downward force and the abductor muscles giving an upward force. As you can see, the weight arm is about two times longer than the effort arm, so the abductor muscles have to work more forcefully in order to overcome this mechanical disadvantage. Mechanism of action. The pelvis and hips are located between the upper body and the lower body and connect the two segments. When you stand on one leg, the center of gravity moves away from the supporting leg and the upper body weight exerts a turning motion around the hip joint of the supporting limb towards the unsupported side. This turning motion to the unsupported side is offset by the abductor action. The greatest force of a muscle that is contracting isometrically occurs when it has a strong and stabilized attachment. In this case, the abductors inserting on the lateral femur. 
Because of the mechanical disadvantage that exists here, the abductive forces must be exerted almost twice as much as the forces by the body weight in order to maintain the center of gravity by balancing the pelvis. The greater the body weight, the more force is required. Adding to the mechanical disadvantage, the pelvis is a closed system. It has no parts working in isolation. Therefore, a unilateral pelvic motion is difficult to stabilize. The hip abductors maintain the level of the pelvis during unilateral standing by contracting on the weight-bearing side so that the opposite pelvis is drawn upwards and the center of gravity shifts towards the center. Therefore, the hip abductors provide control and balance at the pelvis. If these muscles become weak due to or in combination with the following causes, a Trendelenburg sign and or gait is seen. Causes of this failure include a power failure, which may be due to lesions or injury to the superior gluteal nerve that supplies both abductors. This could lead to weakness or paralysis of the muscles. You could have tears in the abductor muscles, or it could be due to diseases such as poliomyelitis, obesity or a sedentary lifestyle, or even immobilization leading to muscle wasting or weakness could lead to a power failure as well. Then we also have a liver failure, such as due to a sacroiliac joint dysfunction, neck of femur fracture, intratocanteric fracture, a vascular necrosis, malunion or delayed union following an IT fracture or a neck of femur fracture. Then you also might have a fulcrum failure, such as due to synovitis of the hip, arthritis of the hip, congenital dislocation of the hip, or even a pathological dislocation of the hip, and um, also following a total hip arthroplasty. So how do we test for the Trendelenburg sign? This is done using the Trendelenburg's test. These are some of the prerequisites. Number one, make sure that you're able to see both the anterior superior iliac spines. Check for any fixed pelvic obliquity, which if present makes the test invalid. And the patient should also hold this position for at least 30 seconds. The technique, expose both anterior superior iliac spines Ask the patient to stand on one leg. It's advisable to start with the unaffected side and then the affected side just for you to be able to compare bilaterally. The pelvis on the unsupported side should be lifted up. If it drops, the test is positive. An uncompensated sign means that the person has not yet adjusted to the changes in the abductor mechanism and they'll exhibit the following features. There will be dropping of the contralateral pelvis, but there is no leaning of the trunk to the affected side yet. Rather, the person might lean slightly towards the unaffected side along with the pelvic drop. The head and neck will usually remain in a neutral position. The compensated Trendelenburg sign. Compensation means the person has or is adjusting to the structural or functional impairment it may take some time to adjust, but when this happens, compensations are made unconsciously. When the person compensates, they are trying to save as much energy as possible. However, this will result in an increase in energy expenditure and stress on other body structures. So be reminded to always give appropriate exercises to both the affected and unaffected limb for this reason. Features of the compensated Trendelenburg sign are leaning of the trunk to the affected side in order to shorten the weight arm and to prevent the pelvic drop. The arm on the affected side may be abducted in an attempt to maintain balance. The head and neck are deviated from the midline to the affected or unaffected side depending on how much compensation there is. The uncompensated gait. This is characterized by dropping of the pelvis on the unaffected side of the body during walking. In the gait cycle, it lasts between heel strike of the affected side 
until just before heel strike of the unaffected side. In short, it's evident during the swing phase of the unaffected limb. Also, the amount of time spent weight bearing on the unaffected side is reduced so the person takes a short step on the sound or unaffected limb and a longer step on the, on the affected side. When both sides are affected, it results in a side-to-side -side gait called a wobbling gait or a chorus girl swing. The compensated Trendelenburg's gait involves leaning of the trunk towards the affected side during stance phase in order to shorten the weight arm and to prevent the opposite hip from dropping. Shortening of the weight arm is done to make up for the weakness of the abductor muscles. Leaning towards the affected side also allows the unaffected limb to clear off the ground. However, this leaning introduces excessive forces to the hip joint, that is, the fulcrum. The person will further compensate by bringing the center of gravity closer to the center of the head of femur, away from the hip joint. Remember, this is done unconsciously. This results in a sideways limb and requires a considerable amount of energy, so it's not an efficient means of ambulation. It also increases the bending forces on the femoral neck, which results in more stresses on the neck. This is definitely not good for your femur as it could lead to serious secondary complications. In this case, the patient is better off using a walking stick in the opposite hand. Some of the weight is transferred to the stick and this reduces excessive stresses on the femoral head and neck as well as the joint. There is also less demand on the abductor muscles. If the stick is used on the affected side, the lateral deviation of the trunk is further exaggerated and this worsens the condition. Also, if you have an injury that requires you to use a stick, using the stick on the affected side even before any major changes take place will lead to Adrian Dellenberg's sign and gait, so it's advisable to use the stick on the unaffected side instead. Did you know that there's few other things that have been named after Friedrich Trendelenburg? There's the Trendelenburg's operation, which is used to treat varicose veins. There's the Trendelenburg's position, which is the position used in surgery, especially of the abdomen, to allow better access to the pelvic organs. There's also the Trendelenburg's cannula, used in surgery of the larynx. This is to prevent the patient from swallowing blood during surgery of the head and neck. Okay guys, that's it. I hope you understood the differences between the uncompensated and compensated sign and the uncompensated and compensated gait, as well as the causes and the mechanisms and the proper use of the stick. If you enjoyed this video, please, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or contributions, feel free to comment. Don't forget to subscribe. Bye!